Welcome back. This is the Uptime Podcast. I am your co-host, Dan Blewett, and I'm joined here remotely by lightning protection expert, Alan Hall. Alan, how you doing? Great, Dan. How are you? Doing all right. Doing all right. It's uh, it's breezy out here in D.C. today. It's pretty nice. Um, still a ghost town, but in general, I'm... I'm getting honestly pretty comfortable being at home every day. What about you? <laughs> You're getting used to self-isolating. I hope I don't yeah, get used to self-isolating. Uh, we're, we're all, you know, comfortably sort of locked into the house. Um, my wife said she, my wife has been delivering uh, groceries to local families that or people that can't really get out of the house or, or probably shouldn't be at the grocery store. Mm-hmm. Uh, she said, uh, she was delivering groceries to uh, somebody in the community and a neighbor popped out and yelled at her she should be wearing that my wife should have been wearing, wearing a mask and I thought well okay it was it, the, the way it was delivered wasn't very um, maybe that wasn't the right approach uh, but the, I think the intent was good so uh, yeah I think people get, yelling, yelling at yelling people is not the way to do it yeah like hey good idea to wear a mask but it was like Hey you, <laughs> hooligan! <laughs> mm-hmm. Get the mask on. Uh, yeah, there's different ways of going about it, but uh, we're we're seeing people uh, people are being a lot more cautious than they were two weeks ago, or even a week ago. Quite honestly, I th- I thought people were some of them were not doing smart things, but that seems to have gone away. So the same people that were like. Uh, out having fun or going to a restaurant or a bar or, or now wearing a mask and are very cautious of other people so maybe the message has gotten through yeah i mean i think that's the real key like if, if we can just cut out all the fun then we'll be good i've heard that <laughs> this specific strain covid19 really thrives on fun thrives so on fun. no ping pong yeah no ping pong no shoots and ladders <laughs> um no what else no jacks that's like a 1940s game yeah there we go yeah um yeah, it's 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 been it's been interesting. I, like I'm never home, so this has really been new for me. Even though I work completely remotely, yeah. I'm still just never home. I just choose to be out working either uh, in a co-working space or in a coffee shop, and just I just that's just my vibe. But mm. I'm finally getting a little more comfortable being just here, which is okay. Like I mean, I'm yeah. productive. Yeah, it's fine. I can do everything I need to do. I have like a setup that I've you know orchestra. I think everyone's. You know, jury rigging, MacGyver rigging their uh, their their little home studio areas or whatever, and so it's you know you start to realize that you're dug in for the long haul. You're resisting it less, and um, just coming to the terms that we're cave people. We're cave people now. We're yeah. just like the people. You know, you find those like little mud uh, little mud caves or like underground layers that humans used to live in two thousand years ago. That's what yeah. we are right now. Kind of like yeah, we were all back to that. Yep. But of course, as a kid, you always wanted a lair. You always want to be Batman, or you know, have like a. You know, here we are. <laughs> yeah, We've but not gotten, not for a month. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We got what we wanted. Yeah, you got exactly what you wanted. Yeah, yeah and it's it's playing havoc uh, still. Obviously, on the on the wind turbine industry, uh, we're getting a lot of feedback that uh, everybody is kind of shut down right now. And uh, you know, one of the big things in the states we were talking about earlier. Uh, was some of the tax incentives have will sunset unless the projects get done uh, which which is trouble which is really gonna be a hard time to get that those things done unless there's changes made to the schedule yeah you think they'd probably accommodate that right i mean everyone seems to understand that like i've seen some very positive articles about you know i think there's one big brooklyn landlord that gave all of his tenants like a free month's rent or Mm. maybe that maybe that's ongoing but there's yeah people are coming around to being a little more altruistic and understanding about like the money's got to go somewhere. So if you default, like, so it seems like you'd guess that maybe they'll push some of these tax credit deadlines back, but you don't know. Yeah. Well, it involves anything that involves Congress. You just never sure until it's done. Um, and and those, and even at the state level, I know that sometimes there are state incentives. So you're kind of playing, um, roulette twice to get both of them to, to agree to do the same thing. We'll, we'll see how it plays out, but obviously um, when citizens call their local congressperson and, and 
or, or write them. Uh, it does make a difference. So, but they're just going to—they're getting flooded. All, all the elected representatives are getting flooded or with, with requests to do things. I don't know how they're going to weed through all of it. And maybe, maybe what will happen is just turn a blind eye to it um, and just let it go, let it slip by, and, and not and not uh, you know hold us to the full letter of the law. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah, it's 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 going to be interesting. So, do you think? There will be a shift, like with all the different types of renewable energy. Will there be winners and losers, just like other industries? Like, would wind come out better than solar, or then Oof. are we gonna have nuclear power plants again? I mean, well, if Bill Gates it- has his way, <laughs> we're gonna have some nuclear power plants, uh, some newer style, uh, some that actually eat old nuclear waste, and that's that's sort of the Bill Gates approach uh, to some of that, but. In the meantime, you know, they're going to, you know, whatever is going to happen on a nuclear scale is going to be a couple of years still. Uh, wind is still extremely viable and is, is is really proven itself over the last several years. Solar, a little bit, um, you know, depending on what, what the players are there. Obviously, Tesla is getting involved, particularly on the battery side. And I, I, we're... <laughs> I was just thinking this afternoon about the the Tesla and the solar thing where we were at Home Depot. This is a couple of months ago, obviously, but we were up at Home Depot, which is a, a local hardware store, a national hardware store chain, and they had the Tesla battery for your home. Wow. All right. Uh, now, it wasn't going to run your home for seven, eight days. It was more like it's going to run it for a day or so, I think, uh, when I did the calculations. But, you know, to walk into a uh, basically a local hardware store and find the ability to power my house now it was a couple of grand if i remember right the price yeah. wasn't quite right but uh 30 years ago no shot anything like that uh so we're, we're going to see some pretty significant changes it looks like there's a lot of of uh pressure for some of the wind turbine companies that have been struggling lately uh, trying to get now they're now they got this on top of it. I'm not sure how they're gonna. It's all gonna play out there. There's gonna be consolidate. I think it's gonna be more consolidation. I think that's ultimately where we're gonna go. We're gonna have consolidation on the OEM equipment side. We're gonna have consolidation on the maintenance side. We're gonna have consolidation on the inspection side. A lot of the small players are gonna get eaten up or just go away. Uh, I'm not sure yeah. that's great for the industry. It depends on who the winners and losers are, but we better come out stronger out of this um, and get ready for the next one, right? And I hopefully that's what we're doing. Yeah. So one thing that's been um, on my mind is obviously there's going to be less maintenance workers to go out and look at any single thing. Like if you, yeah. you know, a tree branch falls on your house nowadays, like it might sit there for a while, right? Like, it so probably does. Yeah, it probably does. It probably does. And ditto for, you know, the wind turbine industry. So. Yeah. You know, with all the maintenance that these require, like they require regular maintenance, they're in very remote areas. So we know they're going to get less attention and less maintenance than than they would normally. So yeah. with all that, they have a lot of systems built in, you know, mm. one of which is lightning detection. So yeah. can you walk us through a little bit about, you know, what do these modern wind turbines have? What do the older styles have? Like, and what are the kind of the, the way that's going with detection systems? So I would say 15 years ago, they probably didn't have much of anything unless you're using like a, a, f- a farmer A farmer yells hey he got hit <laughs> right well that was that was a good way well usually each of the wind turbine uh sites uh, there's a, a couple of people who are close by that kind of keep track and after a storm has come through what they used to do was just go out and just drive the site or walk the site and and just make sure everything looked okay and make sure that everything's producing power they still had uh Data, basically, essentially data systems that were monitoring that if power is coming out correctly and uh, some parameters on the quality of the power that was coming out of it. So there was a very uh, rough way of determining if, if a turbine is not producing power, it may have been struck by lightning. You don't know until you kind of get out there and look at it. Uh, more modern ways, um, there was a big effort two, 15-ish years ago. They basically, what they did is they took a credit card and, and on the credit cards, not that we have this anymore, this is going away too, which is the magnetic strip on a credit card. Mm-hmm. Uh, what they did is they took that credit card and or the magnetic strip on the credit card, they took the credit card because credit cards were cheap. And they basically zip tied it to a down conductor in a, a turbine blade. And as lightning energy ran down that, that down conductor, 
there was a magnetic field associated with that, and they would change the magnetic. Um, it would basically make a magnetic recording on the on the credit card. So you could pull that credit card out and run it through a card reader and tell them how much lightning energy or if it had been struck. It's it's sort of a rough detection method if the blade had been struck without physically hmm. scaling it, right? So you can kind of reach into it and, and, and do this quickie check. Oh, it's not a quickie check, but it's better than nothing. So that was yeah. like a very sort of first generation way of going about it. Uh, then that, that evolved into instrumenting either the tower to see if, if the turbine had been struck. So they put sensors around the tower or on things in the tower. And as lightning current flew, uh, flowed down it, it would, it would trigger. Uh, and then they started instrumenting uh, things up in the nacelle to to tell if the if the turbine had been struck. Pretty pretty simplistic in today's world uh, because you're trying to keep the cost down. It, it just needs to tell you if the thing had been struck. The more modern way of doing it is with the the national lightning detection networks that exist in Europe and the United States and all over the place where they have a series of antennas that are scattered about the country and they, when lightning happens, they can triangulate it and they have um, pretty good accuracy on what the amplitude of that lightning strike is. So not only can they triangulate where it comes from, they can tell if it's a positive lightning strike or a negative lightning strike. It can give you rough estimates on amplitude. And so what they do is they sort of, well, what they definitely do is they, they take the GPS, what they, the coordinates of where they think that lightning strike occurred and run that over like a Google map thing to see what what wind turbine had been struck so it's a uh, sort of gps locating via map and they can provide uh, a wind turbine site say hey turbine number four likely got hit or something near there got hit and they're pretty accurate I, i've seen some of those reports come down they they are actually relatively accurate as to uh where lightning has hit it may it, it's I, I, don't, I don't remember what the last uh, uh, thing I saw on the accuracy of that system, but if you're taking a lightning strike within 100 yards of a wind turbine, it probably hit the wind turbine. And, mm -hmm. and so that's the most modern way. What doesn't involve any electronics in any of the wind turbines, it's done remotely. And it can provide you a live, live data. You can watch a screen and watch your site and watch the thunderstorm come over and see where the lightning strikes are. And then they can kick out a report after the thing happen you have to pay for those services obviously but it's it is probably the quickest and the most accurate way of determining if your wind turbine has been hit by lightning is the new hmm. um, data system those, those those global lightning uh maps are available you can just google it and there's a couple you can see you can see every lightning strike in the world roughly most of them yeah those live. are cool yeah, yeah those are that. really cool because mm -hmm. they give you a sense like wow there's there is a lot of the earth is an electrical being there's electrical activity all the time on the earth if it's not in your local area it's somewhere and it's 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 interesting to kind of watch uh, storms come in and out and and watch those things happen so yeah they're using a lot more high-tech technology to pick out lightning strikes yeah it, it's funny there's the the most lightning strikes in the world i guess is above the the catatumbo river in uh, maracaibo in venezuela mm. And they said there that what is what is the official number here? It's something like a hundred plus per hour, just wow. every day forever, which which is insane. That's that's crazy. Um, I thought Walt Disney World was pretty bad, but that's a lot worse. <laughs> Being in Florida in the summertime, it's like you can sit your watch by it. Yeah, yeah, and I guess it's just the the unique combination of the weather and and just like most of them are like within the clouds. They said. Yeah. But it's just almost like a constant flow of, of electricity, which is, uh, I'm sure, a, a, quite a spectacle to come visit and watch. And you talk about northern lights and all this natural mm. phenomenon. And yeah. I, I'd never really thought much about lightning phenomenon or just having a, a really high concentration of it like that before. Mm. Well, anytime you get uh, convective activity and cold temperatures, you're going you're gonna to have some sort of lightning discharges going on. Even uh, the ones that I've seen over more recently that i think are cool looking are the volcanic lightning strikes so when a vol volcano erupts all the ash is all charged up and it starts to create these discharges in the plumes those are really cool looking i, I know a volcano erupting is a bad bad thing but the, <laughs> the one of the cool things that comes out of it is the the, the, the the lightning strikes that are generated by the volcanoes yeah so when 
someone gets an alert that all right, this turbine's been hit. What do they? What what happens next? Well, uh, they go out and they take a look. Uh, since they're monitoring, they have a lot of remote monitoring that goes on in each of the turbines. Uh, if if some of the sensors have alarms have gone off, the you know, a lot of times they think they're hooked up to cell phones, so their cell phone will buzz and tell them, "Hey, turbine number seven has these error codes, these fault codes, pop up," um, and then they got to send a crew over there to take a look and see if they can restart it and clear those codes or, or what the deal is because uh, sometimes the the faults do have don't have a lot to do with the operation it's sort of extraneous pieces of equipment but um you don't want to have codes pop up and that's you see a lot of uh advertising lately for companies that are uh, i just saw one yesterday so the, uh, the what what i've been seeing is hey uh avoid these uh uh essentially wind turbine error codes when lightning strikes put our magic system in and and it'll prevent this stuff from happening uh so it's in a computerized digitized world today uh there's a lot of information is provided to the the repair people to know what to go look for it's not much different than even an, an airplane today where the airplane will tell you what's wrong with it so you can start taking a general look at what to go find in it or a car i mean right even in a car Cars will tell you what's wrong with them, even though the engine com- the engine light may come on. There's a way to quickly detect as what component has gone bad. It's sort of like that. Gotcha. And then, I mean, I know we talk a bunch about drones being more and more useful for inspections. Yeah. Do you feel like there's any kind of uh, maybe like a hub system in the future where you know you have a cluster of a hundred turbines up on a mountain and there's just like a little docking station where protected from the weather and there's a couple drones in there and you can remotely open the hatch and out they fly to inspect yeah uh, you know the guys at sky specs and in, in michigan have a system that's similar to that i don't know if the drones are are located uh, specifically at each of the sites i think they send the drones around but the training involved is very minimal and it's the drones are pre-programmed to scan the wind turbines so I think the the drones know what kind of wind turbine we're looking for, and they kind of get the things generally oriented, oriented in the right direction, and then it's just automated. It just runs, and it flies mm-hmm. around, and it takes pictures, and provides data, and it down, and it saves all the data so that somebody can go back and look at it. Uh, that's huge. We'll talk about a huge improvement. It's it's the drone is. I th- you know, there are technologies in the drone that they spend a good bit of time developing the drone and developing the, 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 the methodology to fly it, an automated flight. But I think that the bigger thing for them is the amount of data they're going to have about the performance of any particular kind of wind turbine. So if, you, if, you had, if they're using their drone and, requiring, and, and acquiring all this data, they have this, uh, huge, essentially this huge data set of types of damage that are particular to a specific type of wind turbine so they can sort the data and actually analyze and predict i think it'd be easy to predict where failures are going to occur based on other wind turbines similar wind turbines based on what you have data on already taking so you can sort of project out like all right so we we were out in utah and we we uh, did a scan of a bunch of wind turbines that were 15 years old of this particular model and we saw xyz happen on these wind turbines well project back to the wind turbines that are only five years old same model that are only five years old would you make some changes to those now so you don't have that problem at 15 years that's the kind of data sets that sky specs is going to have and how they're going to manipulate it and generate it and share that data i think it's going to be the interesting part about them it's not so much the the, the measurement itself as much as the accumulation of the data and the manipulation of the data to make it useful for engineers to go back and make mods to their designs so that they can avoid problems in the future. I think the same thing exists for uh, sky specs in relationship to lightning strike damage that if they start taking enough data and start recording enough data, you can accumulate how blades are taking strikes and where weak points are and chart to then accumulate enough data to, to get predictive, like, okay, this is why we're having a trouble with this particular blade, but not that one. Or is, mm-hmm. it, is it area located? I know a lot of times, if you look at a wind turbine farm on a map, they kind of run in the U.S., they kind of run north to south for the most part. Uh, so the wind turbines on the end of that farm are the ones that get struck the most, and the ones in the middle less. 
Well, the ones that's further west get struck first and take much of the energy out of the clouds, and the ones that are further east don't see as many lightning strikes. Data like that is really important because if you know that going in, you can put protection where protection is needed and eliminate it where you don't need it. And the, so the interesting thing about a, a, a kind of a sky specs company is not the hardware. The drones are cool, but what's more important in their industry is the data and the data manipulation. And I, I'm curious to see how they uh, organize themselves as a company. I think they're I think they're doing a lot of fundraising right now and trying to get to that point of being more like a Google and less yeah. like a. Uh, a drone company and that's brilliant i think that's where companies that get smart are going to start taking the data and getting it into the hands of the oems and the and the operators so that they can prevent things from happening in the future no yeah, no that makes sense so as you talk about maybe you know the geographic location mattering as far as which ones in a cluster get hit yeah why why don't they have almost like lightning rods that are significantly taller than the whole cluster of wind turbines. Well, wind turbines are pretty high. <laughs> yeah, build, start build, there. build one higher. Well, yeah, you could. You, you could. Uh, and uh, the thing is, they sort of have that already because they already have a, a, a basically a MET station, which is a meteorological station that's measuring wind direction and amplitude. They do that as part of the site survey. So before they put the wind turbines out there, they're taking a site survey to, to measure the winds in a very specific location and kind of see what the averages are over a period of time so they can get a sense of what type of wind turbine would be effective in those kind of winds and in, in that wind environment. And those towers are just basically metal towers, right? So they stick them up. and that, But they, they tend to be in the middle of the wind turbine field when they're done. They're not on the ends. Uh, mm -hmm. You could put something on the end and attract some of the lightning away. I think that's possible. Uh, is it going to be 100% effective? No. And because lightning is sort of random. It isn't like the, the, the wind turbines in the middle don't get in a, in a line that's kind of going, runs west to east. The ones in the middle don't get struck. They do get struck just less, less often. So you could mitigate some of the lightning damage by putting up a metal tower. I, I just watched a video the other day of um, the new, uh, what do they call it, catenary system. So it's a bunch of wires at, at the... Um, uh, Cape Canaveral. At Cape Canaveral, when they're doing some of these new spacecraft launches, the low Earth orbit, uh, you know, sort of the new spacecraft that are going on, they have changed the system around the launch area from this, the space shuttle type to now they essentially have four, I think it's four big towers taller than the rocket. It's in the middle. So there's a rocket in the middle, and there's four big towers, and there's basically a cable that runs around the whole perimeter of the thing to attract lightning before it hits the rocket. Uh, hmm. So that same philosophy you could apply, sort of. Obviously, you're not going to surround the whole wind turbine field with a big wire. That would be a really long wire. But you could do the tower concept uh, to attract lightning and, and to basically take some of the charge out of the cloud. I mean, that, that, that's a possibility, yeah. yeah. But you don't see it a lot. You hear it talked about a lot, but I don't see it a lot. Yeah. That's interesting. So. Obviously, there's not just you know trying to protect them from strikes, but also just monitor so they can get out there in a timely fashion. And yeah. I mean, are they are are most parts that are going to get hit? They're going to take maybe just they see some damage or they see just signs of it. Are they going to pull the thing apart, or are they just going to be like, okay? It seems fine. Like how deep do they dive back in there? Uh, and then the cells where the electronics are that are controlling everything. Usually, they haven't they have. Well, the most time they have some spare parts, so they're going to take us. They'll have the codes. They'll tell them what's wrong. They'll bring the spare parts over, and because it's probably happened before, they have the spare parts available, and they're going to swap out those parts. That's what they're going to do. Um, I happened. I, I was I had a discussion about this the other day about being in West Texas at some of the early wind turbine sites and walking into the uh, repair shack. I'll call it, uh, and seeing just piles of anemometers sitting there. And there must have been 50, <laughs> 50 that had gone bad from lightning strikes or near lightning strikes. Um, so it's sort of re repeat business. What has failed in the past is probably going to fail in the future unless there's some big design mod change. So the, the repair people pretty much know what they're going in and go fix. On the structural side, uh, that's a little bit different because they'll have to have some means of 
either trying to photograph the blade, and that's the thing now because cameras are relatively inexpensive, they're electronic, and you can get some decent lenses. You can do some decent inspections on the ground with uh, higher power cameras and just basically taking the scan and taking some snapshots and looking up and down for any sort of obvious defect. Uh, beyond that, you're basically putting somebody out there on a rope to go look at it. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, and that seems like a like a ton of work. And Yo, so, like you said, it's, yeah. it's it's all about yeah minimizing those they got enough calls to, do. to your drones. Yeah, and then there's yeah, there, yeah and, the, and the repair people have enough to do already, just to keep the everything operational. Especially if you got fifty, a hundred wind turbines on one side, you have a lot of work to do. Every and plus you got to climb up and climb down. It's a time eater. Uh, so any other additional failure besides this normal wear and tear it starts to overwhelm some of these groups. It's hard to keep those things up and running. Yeah, I'm going to throw you for a loop because we didn't talk about this, but do you do you see the 3D printing industry having any impact on wind turbine parts or blade manufacturing or any of that going um, forward? Maybe. Uh, I know 3D printing, I, in fact, I had a meeting this morning about how... Uh, uh, aerospace company was using 3d printing to uh speed up the process of some of the things that they're designing i don't think well i'll take that back i'm sure there are places there are always places that you can make a part uh quicker faster and maybe on the repair side where you could actually have a 3d printer on site to make a repair part or a temporary repair part to kind of get you going kind of like we're doing right now for the the covid masks right so having a 3d printer is really handy if you you can make your own protection um, from the yeah. from the virus. Well, that same sort of thing can, I think, when the when the price of the printers comes down enough and the standardization of the materials happens, which is which is what's happening now, um, I think you're going to be able to print some parts on site. Uh, and which instead of having a bunch of loose parts in a bin, that you're going to you know they don't really need all that often. And that rare occasion, you need this one one part, and you just need something temporary to hold it in place until the real part makes it. A 3D printer is probably going to be the thing. Yeah, it's such a cool technology, and I, oh, I mean, yeah. we've heard heard more and more about it, but it's still not something that we see in our life. Like you don't see them really at Best Buy. Like you can get mm. one, but I don't have anything that exists in my life that's been 3D printed. You know what I oh, mean? No? Like I don't have a 3D printed bowl yet, or a Tupperware, or or huh. anything like that yet. But I assume that's coming. It just seems like that's haven't yeah. quite got there yet. Uh. I don't have any. I'll take, uh, obviously, in my aircraft work, I've been around a lot of 3D printed parts. We were doing 3D printed parts for aircraft uh, 10 years ago in interiors. And I think a lot of interiors pieces are, are done that way. Uh, I, in, in the house, in, in the home, totally not. I mean, it's just you're making plastic mm -hmm. toys that are, you're spending yeah. eight bucks to make a little plastic toy that's 30 cents to buy at a store, right? It makes no sense. Uh, but on the industrial side, definitely, I, I know locally there's some local companies around us that have 3D printers and have had them for a couple of years and are actually using them, uh, mostly for prototyping out pieces, like quick and dirty prototypes to see if something will fit or mm -hmm. how it feels in the hand or how it mates up. That's really handy, very handy thing to have. Yeah, and then I, I assume if you have you know more in-depth tools like a CNC machine, you can just rough out a part and then quickly machine it to where you need it to be or, or yeah, whatever. And but a CNC machine's minimum uh, <laughs> tens of thousands yeah. of dollars, right? They're not, yeah, they're not, they're not cheap. No, yeah. and a 3D printer, I, I've seen some 3D printers now in the $1,000, no, they're not great 3D printers, but they have uh, in the $1,000 range. So it's like a, a, form, a, a cost savings, a factor of 100. So, yeah. 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 Well, when you see that technology, like my sister has a cricket machine. Do you know what those are? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I mean that's like you know it's computer and American controlled. I guess it's not mm -hmm. a true CNC, but it's right. you know it's like die die cutting stickers and yeah uh, invitations and yes. and, and pa paper products, which yes. is cool. So yeah. yeah, I mean you wonder if that technology is going to eventually make it into our kitchen where I can. 3D print a, an extra ramekin for my house party for you know for <laughs> or make love. a spoon or we, something I don't know <laughs> all right yeah just make uh, yeah, make spaghetti spoons fork. out of yeah exactly well and, and that's a, a really interesting I don't know if you ever saw this it was maybe a couple of years ago but the guy was trying to make um, low cost edible um, utensils 
Mm. And this was just like a, a major, like a hunger initiative, but also a reduced waste initiative that if you could create these, and it was more like a spork, I think, design where, you know, it's like a multi-purpose <laughs> utensil. But if you could make it cheap enough, like two cents or something, I don't know where the cost, I can't remember what the cost breakdown was, yeah. but if you can make this cheap enough where you can legitimately eat out of it. And it was, I think, really, really, uh, really, really dry and hard. So it would actually last more than... It wasn't just. Is it you know, just compostable or is it eatable? What, what's it? What's it, it? It was edible. No, why do you want to? Why do you want edible? <laughs> eatable, <laughs> edible. Uh, why would you want to eat it? Because then nothing goes to waste. Okay. I mean, rather than throw it in a landfill, I mean, if it's just like a, and in my mind, it, it probably tasted a little bit like those um, sawdust. <laughs> I mean, probably not far, but I mean, you think of just like one I mean, of those I, like I can compost it. I get the whole composting thing. That's cool, right? I don't yeah, know. I don't know was, if I'm eating my fork. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it was kind of like a uh, like a like a biscuit you'd have for tea, like but like super hard, like biscotti hard, and well, that's hard. just kind of like lightly lightly sweet, but just like a <laughs> you know looks like dried. Uh, I don't know, but. Yeah, it kind of like almost like a bread product, but if you kind of think of like church communion, where it just doesn't have a whole lot of taste. No, but this would be like obviously much more sturdy and strong. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, what if you could just whip up your own utensils in your house and then make breakfast and then eat them and then like <laughs> crazy, you know? <laughs> well, hey, hey, you know what? I'm sure somebody's thought about it. I sure, I'm sure somebody has tried it. You know, the the market will tell you whether it's going to live or live or not. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, like a little tangent here, but you know, when you talk about you know all the replacement consumable parts, not only in mm. the industrial industrial world, but yeah. also our own life. Yeah, there's so much consumable stuff. Whether it's a wind turbine getting struck by lightning, and yeah. you're going through fuses and and, yeah. and all these different parts, or just your own home life and going through forks and bowls and yeah, well, Tupperware and all that stuff. We we have been over the last couple of weeks working on the recyclability of everything we're doing as far as shipping is concerned. And looking at that from a reuse standpoint, an eventual recycling, we want, we want to be able to reuse as much as we humanly can on, um, or keep it in the chain as long as we can and in the reuse side before it gets recycled. So it's not one and done. And, mm -hmm. and we've actually spent a good bit of time and money on that because we think it's important um, that we don't just make a piece of plastic and then dump it. That's, that's not the way that we ought to be thinking about these things. We need to be thinking like, we're going to use this piece of plastic, we're going to use it, use it, use it, and then at the end, we, it needs to be recyclable at the end. And and taking a different thought process on it. And the same thing with all of our packaging. It's similar to what Amazon has done, where they've tried to minimize, and they kind of mm -hmm. have it figured out. But just re reducing the amount of stuff that's in the package um, that needs to be handled. We're looking at that really seriously now. Um, and, and just basically to, to, to tie in with everything else, right? Everybody else is looking at it, and why aren't we? We should be looking at it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you when you really start to think about how much trash we create, whether yep. it's, you know, just getting groceries and coming home and unpacking them, or, mm -hmm. you know, like you said, getting parts for whether it's a wind turbine aircraft or just anything in your home, there's just so much. Everything's wrapped and wrapped and wrapped for our safety. Yeah. But at the same time, it's just... It's crazy and it's untenable at some point. Like we have to create less waste for our planet. Or it needs to be recyclable, right? And I, and I have to be fortunate enough to, to get a, a new phone over the last week. I've been waiting and waiting and waiting to, to, to do it. And the interesting thing about it, I was showing my daughter, everything about that packaging is completely recyclable. There was no, pla I don't even know if there was shrink wrap on that thing. Um, it came in a card, recycled cardboard box, and everything about it could be tossed into general paper recycling. Uh, Twenty years ago, but what, it would have been. But was it edible? But was it, it edible? Well, I mean, you could eat anything as paper, right? <laughs> it would probably tastes like that spork, <laughs> but right. Eventually, but it, but if it's if it's cellulose based, if it's paper based, you know, you can be able to put that in the, in the recycling stream, and you know, maybe somebody else, the next person, will get a phone with the paper that I had in mind. That's awesome. That's the way. That's what we should be doing. Yeah, I and mean, that's the goal. And I mean, that's right. if, if anything in this re in renewable energy sector, that's you know, doing it to help the planet and obviously find more affordable energy sources. So yeah. um, before we wrap up, I do want to get your thoughts one more time real quick about um, nu nuclear power. So 
It's mm. interesting to me because they pitched it as a, a really cheap, like a very efficient energy source. Obviously, we had the two disasters, Three Mile Island and Chernobyl. Mm. And so people would just have a very strong emotional re- reaction to it. Mm. I mean, pardon, pardon the pun. Mm. Um, but uh, do you see nuclear coming back? I know you yes. mentioned Gil- Bill Gates' his thing, but from everything I read about it, that it's incredibly powerful. Again, another pun, but um, like it's really, really efficient. We just are now too afraid to use it. Is that the general consensus? I don't know if we're afraid to use it as much as we needed to to take the knowledge that we had and fix the areas that we didn't like. Uh, obviously, the safety aspect, one. Um, there would be no way we're building something similar to Chernobyl. And Three Mile Island, as, as serious as an event that was, nobody died in that. Uh, so, you know, there, obviously there has been some safety thought before those things were designed, but there's a lot of new technology that's happened over that time, and I think the, the new technology is called Gen 4. And there, whatever that latest, uh, is it on Netflix, the Bill Gates, Inside Bill Gates' Brain, isn't that the name of the, of the series? He talks about the, the investments he's making in some of these newer uh, nuclear technologies, and I know they were trying to, I thought they had got the green light to make a nuclear uh, power plant over in China. And that, that happened, I think that happened 2016 or 2017, and then of course the United States and China got into a, a little bit of a trade tussle, so that sort of stopped, and now they're talking about trying to build it somewhere in the United States, but the technology is interesting, and the amount of, of advancements that have been made in where these new uh, nuclear power sites will take the old nuclear energy that the, we, we, had, we had scrapped and stockpiled, we can use that as fuel in these new nuclear reactors. That's a significant step, and if it can minimize the amount of nuclear waste or really thoroughly use all that nuclear material, because I think the older, older style nuclear power plants were not very efficient of using all the energy stored in that in that uh, fissionable material. If we can harness that and we're going to spend a lot of money to go do it and obviously Bill Gates has a lot of had a lot of resources and can bring a lot of people to the table there. There's a chance, there's a really good chance that we can do nuclear much more efficiently and much more safely than we did it back in the in the 1970s. That would be good. Now, uh, as a bigger overall energy sector, do we still need to have a variety of energy sources? Absolutely, we'll need a variety of energy sources because nuclear is not the answer for everything. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's probably appropriate in some places. In other places, it's not going to be appropriate, right? So you need to have a v- different variety of energy sources available uh, at hand, and you need to choose the right one for the right situation. Nuclear yeah, will be good, right? So nuclear will be good. But we're not going to get rid of wind, and we're not going to get rid of solar, and we're not going to get rid of oil and gas immediately. It's going to take a lot of time to figure out where we can appropriately use each one of those and what effect it has on the planet, and then figure it out. Figure out from a from a kind of overall strategy standpoint on on the power distribution of into the world, what works where and why, and what can we tolerate, and what you know maybe we have to make a hard decision to say, hey, you know what, nuclear is not going to work. In this place, there's a lot of earthquakes. We're going to have to go to some part gas, uh, some part wind, some part solar. Okay. Uh, but, you know, I, I do think in our lifetimes, uh, we're going to see some dramatic changes in the way power is generated around the world. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think we've learned too much in the last 50 years, I mean, since the 70s, that we've got to give it another chance. And Yeah. And not just, you know, shun that, that power source forever. Well, and but. think about the computers. that uh, I think the reason Bill Gates is involved in it is because a lot of the, the advances have been sort of computationally related. We have the ability to, to simulate a lot of these highly complicated uh, fission reactor things with a computer. And back in the 60s, when a lot of the early first nuclear sites were developed, they were still using mostly slide rules to do them, uh, and the simulations did not exist except on huge IBM mainframes, possibly, and even that had been rudimentary. So uh, there has been a huge technological shift, and uh, on the computing power side, that's gonna come back and feed back into having, well, obviously it's made better wind turbines, there's no doubt about that. Computationally, we've done a lot more on wind turbines because we had computing power. 
We've done the same thing in the oil and gas industry. We're, we're burning things more efficiently than we ever have in the four. And we're going to do that in the nuclear industry, too. It's just a matter of time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Alan, we're going to wrap up here. But yeah. uh, for all of you out there listening, um, thanks for being here. This, again, was the Uptime Podcast, where we talk about renewable energy, wind turbines, and uh, lightning protection. So if you're new here, definitely subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, check out our YouTube channel. We have a lot of videos and yeah. short clips of uh, podcast episodes, as well as helpful lightning protection tutorials. So if you need that stuff, definitely check it out. And visit our website at weatherguardwind.com. Alan, thanks so much. Great, uh, great talk today. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. All right, and we'll see you next time.